Welcome to Smithville Baptist Church with Pastor Terry Alford. People often wonder, how can I know Jesus? You find him here in the Bible. Did you know that in the Bible there are over 7,000 promises by God just for you? I want to encourage you to open this Bible and make those promises as your own. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now let's check out today's message. Father God, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you, Lord God, for what this day represents in our lives. For without Easter, without Resurrection Sunday, we would have no hope. But that hope was provided because you willingly gave of your life on Friday and sacrificed everything and took the beatings and the whippings and the scourgings and the, and the uh, ridicule and the shame and you took it all upon yourself and you hung on the cross and you willingly and you never spoke a word to tell them to stop. But you willingly took it all just for us. I pray, Lord God, that that message would get through to each person in this place today. That Jesus did everything. And all we need to do is to believe it and receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 24 of Luke. Very familiar words. Usually you hear these kind of words every Easter morning. It says, Now on the very first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, which are the women that we're talking about back in 55 and 56, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb preparing the, or bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus and it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man should be must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. I want to preface everything by telling you, when you read the, the, the accounting of the risen Christ, you want to take all four Gospels and put them together, you get a lot more out of them. But we're going to stick with Luke today. But, it, it, but it's, it's wonderful how it mixes, because, like, in, for instance, in the book of John, it's Peter and John raced, because John remembers it, because John beat Peter and he makes a point of it, and now it's a legacy that Peter, or John runs faster than Peter. So these are things that you can pick out as you go through the Gospels. And I want to really quickly go through this part because I really want to concentrate on the next part. But here we have the, the, the women had been, this is the other thing that's amazing. Throughout the crucifixion, where did you find the women? They were right there at the cross. They didn't run and hide. Where were the disciples? There was only one disciple that dared show his face at the crucifixion, and that was John. Everybody else was in hiding. That's amazing. But the women were there. They would never leave his side, and he, they watched and went through all of it with him. And one of the women was actually his mother, which is astounding. Because you, can you imagine as a mother watching your child hanging on a cross after being beaten to a point where she couldn't even recognize him? And she just stood there, and she didn't cry out either because she knew what the Lord, the angel had told her many years before, that this was going to take place. This is what your son is here for. And uh, 
So she was there. But they, they, they had the biggest problem that they were concerned about was the finding the stone. They knew that there was a big stone there. They didn't know how they were going to get it moved. And yet when they got there, the job was done. And, and, I, and that's the way God works in our lives. There's so many things sometimes in our lives that we face some things. And we don't know how we're going to get through it. And then all of a sudden we get there, oh, the stone is already moved. We can get through. God has already prepared that for us. And, and that's awesome. Now I want to make a point too also that when the stone was rolled away, it was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. When the stone was rolled away, it was rolled away so that people could look in to see that, God, or that Jesus had already raised from the dead. He was already gone. Now you find that hard to believe? Well, just think in a little bit, you're going to find out that he all of a sudden appears in a room that is locked. He had his spiritual body. And he was able to do that. And folks, if there's one thing I'm looking forward to when I get to heaven is that spiritual body. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to say, well, okay, I want to be, uh, let's go to Chicago. There. That's what I'm thinking about. But I just like, forgive me on my little thoughts that take off on me. So anyway, the stone rolled away from the tomb, and, they, and so they, they were going to take care of him, finish up the embalming process. And when they did, but they got there and there was no body. Jesus was gone, and they couldn't understand this. But they looked in, and they said it was like two men, but we consider that those are angels. Angels and men. men. Angels appear a lot like men. In Hebrews, we find out that angels can walk among you, and you don't even know that they are uh, angels because they look just like you and me. But they were there, and they asked to the women, what are you looking for? Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? And I think that goes to our own lives. Many times we seek out a way of life in our own world that we know will produce death. And we're trying to find life in it, i.e. drugs, alcohol, and that kind of stuff. We look for that there. And yet, it, all that does is produce death. And here, the, the women are in a graveyard looking for someone that they didn't remember was going to be alive. He, he didn't, he, the, the angel said, he's not here, he's risen. Remember what he spoke to you. And boy, don't we ever need that. All the time, we need to be reminded, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? That's why we keep talking about get into the Word and do it daily so that you've got fresh memory of what Jesus says. Because we aren't made to go through this world without the Word of God in our hearts. We can't function that way. We don't really have life that we could have that we find in Jesus because He is life. And so when they told him the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again, and then all of a sudden, bing, the light comes on. Oh yeah, I remember that. But as far as remembering, it's one thing, but understanding it is another. And they still didn't quite get it. They didn't understand it. We read in other accountings where, where uh, Jesus, which is, I think is awesome, and, and, and maybe this is the thrust of the message, is that no matter where you are, Jesus will find you if you're looking for him. Wherever you are in your walk, wherever you are in your life, Jesus will find you. And here Mary Magdalene has talked about in one of the Gospels how she turned around and thinking it was the gardener and, and looking for Jesus, and Jesus goes, Mary, spoke her name. And we recall how Scripture tells us that the sheep of God will know, their, know his voice. The sheep knows the shepherd's voice. And she recognized him. Well, that, was, that was first thing in the morning. And oftentimes on Easter morning, this is what we talk about, is what happened at the grave and, and all that. But it just dawned on me that maybe you guys all knew this. I'm, a, probably just, I'm just coming along late. I never put the road to Emmaus on Easter Sunday. It never dawned on me that this was the same day. But it, what did dawn on me when it finally started to click is Jesus was pretty, pretty, pretty busy on Easter. He was pretty busy. He came across Mary and comforted her. He met with the, the other women, saw him, and comforted them. And then 
Let's move on to, the, the, to chapter, or verse 13. It says this, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, I did a little, I love Google because I got on Google and I said, okay, I think my, my house to Adams is about seven miles. Well, I looked up Pearl's Pastries, and from Pearl's Pastries to my house is 6.2 miles. So if I ever get an urge and I don't have a vehicle, I've got to work, walk 6.2 miles. Well, that 6.2 miles, according to Google, will take me two hours, 2.2 hours to get there. Well, that'll deter me from wanting a donut, I'll tell you that. But these guys are walking about seven miles. So this is about a two to two and a half hour walk for these guys. So it's, it's good to keep that in mind. So they're, they're on the way. Now, these are two of the guys that were with the disciples. And now they decided they had to go to the village seven miles away. And as they talked together of all these things which had happened, and as and they talked together of all these things that, which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now I want you to picture that. Isn't that awesome? Two guys walking along and they're, they say they're, 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 they're trying to figure things out. What went wrong? We thought Jesus had come to rescue us, to get rid of the Romans and to make us a new kingdom and we're going to be the power of, of the world and everything is going to be okay and, and, and he'll be around to, to heal us when we get sick and to feed us when we get hungry. And what happened? He's gone. And they're trying to figure this all out. And Jesus shows up. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And boy, do we ever suffer with that problem. So many times, we don't recognize when we're in the middle of a situation that if we just opened our eyes, we would see Jesus there. You recall the promise, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And yet when we get into situations, oh my gosh, the world is coming to an end. I don't know what we're going to do. This problem is it's overwhelming. I don't know how we're ever going to get through it. And Jesus is right there. But we get blinded. You know, he said he came to heal the blinded people. And most of those blind people could actually see. I was one of them. One day some years ago, the Lord opened my eyes to the truth and set me free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So anyway, Jesus, they didn't know who he was there. And so, verse 17, he says, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? See how he was so compassionate. He recognized their sadness. And he was wanting to know what was going on. And he, he, he was interested, just like he is with you. He's interested in every little aspect of your life, along with all the big ones. So the one that... Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, and I don't know if he said this sarcastically or what, but he says, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known things which happened there in these days? Basically, have you been living under a rock? And, I, I, I mean, they're, they're sad. They're depressed. They're just discouraged and everything. And then here gets guys come along and it's like, he, he's from an, another world. He's like, how could you possibly not know what's going on? <laughs> Can you imagine Cleopas now knowing for all of his life as talking to Jesus and tell, telling him that? <laughs> he's remembered for that statement. And Jesus, he said to them, what things so? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now, interesting. All you good parents out there, which I think all the parents out here are good parents, I'm sure when your child comes to you and says, I got a problem, you don't immediately give them the answer to his problem. Don't you sit and listen to them 
and let them tell their side of the story? I think so. If you, you're not shaking your head, so as good parents, you should listen to the story. <laughs> But, but, but I love that. Jesus is willing. He knows all things. He was there. What could he tell them about what was going on was a whole way of a lot more than what they could tell him. But he doesn't care about that. He wants to hear them. He wants to know their heart. He wants to, where are you today? And so they said, things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, that's who they believed he was. He was the prophet. Mighty indeed in word. They, they understood that he had done these mighty things, these miracles, and awesome things they'd done for three years all over the place. He said, this is him, and, and, and he was mighty in deed and, and word. And I love that because every time he spoke, they were in awe. Where does this wisdom come from? He said they compared it, somebody compared him once to the Pharisees. They never talked like this. They never had the authority. But Jesus spoke with authority, and it's recognizable. You know that, don't you? If somebody stands up here and tells you something and they are an authority on it, you respect that. Well, Jesus is an authority on life. And they heard him. And they recognized it. Verse 20 says, And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. And I thought that's an intriguing statement they made. And this is the third day. This is the third day. I'm wondering if somewhere, somewhere there was just something gnawing at their mind. They were memory saying, remember Jesus said something about on the third day? But they didn't, couldn't, couldn't get it. It's like that, that computer that doesn't quite reach out and grab that tidbit of information. It, they just couldn't get it, but it, but it was intriguing to them. They, had wait, they, they mentioned three, the third day. And he said that, on verse 22, and he went on and he said, Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying what they had also seen, a vision they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. That had to just blow them right apart. They did, unbelievable. And they still couldn't wrap their heads around. They couldn't understand it. That's why they were reasoning. Well, how can this be? The body's not there, and yet, and yet uh, the, the angels are saying, well, he's alive. What does this all mean? And that's why they're talking and reasoning together. They don't understand. They don't get it. And certain of those, oh, verse 22 again, I'll say, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Now, I find it interesting in the fact that they went... And the women, what they saw was exactly what the women said. But they didn't know the, they, we have a little accent over here. Yeah. Is did, did that, what, that what we heard? <laughs> well, they said that in this story, the, the earth shook at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those guys that once I get off a track, I've got to find my way back. <laughs> they recognized the women had told the truth, that everything that they said was the way it was. But they still, Jesus wasn't there, and they, didn't, they could not connect the dots. I guess that's the best way to do it. They just could not connect the dots. Have we ever been there? You just can't figure out what's going on. They could not connect the dots. And then Jesus says, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart. Now, that's not being negative. Foolish ones in this case means they're kind of dull. They're unwise. They don't have the knowledge. He said, And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? 
Isn't that the same thing as the angels told the girls? Wasn't he supposed to go through all this and then, and then rise again? And so Jesus, and I love this about him, he took his time and he began at Moses and all the prophets, and he started right here. What Moses wrote, the first five books, and all the way through. And he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Two, I'm going to say it was a two and a half hour walk and they got Jesus sharing scripture for two hours, explaining to them how this word talked about this day. You see, in the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's Jesus. And it was prophesied all the way through this. It was example after example. And he shared this with them. What, how would you like to have been on that trip? I'd actually limp along seven miles if I thought I could hear him talk to me like that. So verse 28 says, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that they would have gone farther. But they constrained him saying, Abide with us, for it is toward the evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table. So obviously they went into a restaurant, motel, hotel, whatever, you know. They were there, they're going to sit down and have something to eat. And he sat down with them. He sat down at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And it was that one motion of breaking bread. And why? It says, then their eyes were open and they knew him. And what would that be? It's because how many times in three years had they seen Jesus take the bread and break it and have it blessed and give it to them? Over and over and over again, Jesus did this to him. And you know as well as I do that you might not have seen a person for a long time, but if there's certain uh, characteristics of that person that have always stood out and you run across this person again and they do this one thing, he says, I know who you are just because of what you did. It's understandable. That's just natural. And these guys recognize that it was Jesus who broke the bread and blessed it and gave it to them. And it, what's amazing is it says they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And he was gone. But they didn't say they were upset, does it? Doesn't say they were upset at all. In fact, it looks to me like they're pretty excited. And he said to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? You know, when you're hearing truth, it gets right into your heart. When you're hearing truth, and that's what changes people, is when they hear truth and they allow it into their heart, when you roll the stone of your, your graveyard, your grave or tomb in your heart, when you roll that stone away and you let the truth in, it'll burn inside you and it's something wonderful. It's not a heartburn that we want to take pills for or whatever. It's a real burn that we desire to know more. And, and, and this is what happened with them. And so what did they do? Here it is, evening. They were going to bed down for the night, but they rose up that very hour. And they returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together and saying, the Lord is risen indeed. Now I'm going to suggest, and I wasn't there, but if it took them two and a half hours to get to Emmaus from Jerusalem, I bet you it took them an hour and a half to get back because they were so excited. They couldn't wait to get back to tell them because now they understood. They understood scripture, the scriptures that said that Jesus had to come and he had to give up his life and he had to take all the beatings and, and the scourging upon himself so that you may be rescued from what you are looking forward to, which is death, the penalty of death. He took it all. He took it all. And here's an interesting thing. 
saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Now, we don't understand that, and I think this is intriguing. There's a place in Paul writes about it in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, says that uh, the Lord appeared to many, and Cephas, which is another name for Peter. It never tells us about that personal meeting that Jesus had with Peter. It just tells us that there was a meeting. Wouldn't you have liked to have known what was going on at that meeting? You remember Peter? Remember how, Lord, I'll be with you. Don't you worry about that. If everybody else fails you, I guarantee I'll be with you to the end. You can't get rid of me. I'm going to be there. I don't know him. That wasn't me. I don't know him. And he cursed him. And all of a sudden, the rooster crowed. And he recognized he's no better than the rest. He couldn't. And now shame overtook him. And he couldn't possibly show his face at the crucifixion for fear. But I don't know if it was as much fear of the, what man could do to him as the fact that I don't want Jesus to look at me again. He already saw me when, I, that when the rooster crowed, remember, and they had eye contact. That had to crush him. That had to be so crushing because he remembered how boldly he said, I will be with you to the end, and yet he didn't make it a day. You ever been there? So here they are in the upper room. Gather together. The two guys are coming in. They're telling what all that took place and how the Lord, or the, Jesus had, had revealed the scriptures to them and everything else. And while they're standing there and we read in other scriptures, they're in the locked upper room. The doors are locked. The windows are barred. There, nobody can get in there. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. He just appeared. Just like he left the tomb, he appeared in the upper room. And this is what he said. Peace to you. How many want peace? Seriously, how many want peace in their life? Seriously, do you want peace? Jesus is the only one that offers peace for you. And it's a free gift to you. He paid tremendously for it. But it's a gift that he wants to give to you. It was prophesied that he was going to be the Prince of Peace. I really want each one to, to think about it. Do you want peace in your heart? Forget about what's going on around you. Forget who's sitting beside you. Forget about the fact that I'm looking at you. But really do a heart check. Do you want peace? Isn't that, we're, we're no different than these disciples that were saying, we thought that this guy was going to come and he's going to uh, get rid of the Romans for us and take over this whole kingdom. We're in the same boat, folks. We live in a world of turmoil. Absolute bedlam. And it doesn't make any sense and it doesn't get any better. It just gets worse. It gets more and more. And the bottom of the, the whole thing is the people that are going through all these things, there is no peace. I love the fact that you go to the uh, Miss Universe or Miss America pageants and, oh, and yesteryear, I don't even know what they do now. I haven't seen one in 25 years, but I remember it used to be, they always do this feel. What would you like if you could do anything in this world? I would like world peace. But I think that goes back to the basics. We all want peace in our life. We all want to be able to go home and be at peace in our family. We all want to be able to go to our workplace and have peace with our coworkers. 
We all want to go and, 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 and uh, whatever we do, we want to be around people where there's peace. Because when we're in peace, we're enjoying life. Verse 37 says, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit still. Now, I don't know. It's interesting. It says they. It was a generic statement. I don't know about the two that were just came back there. They must have recognized him. I don't know about Mary. Mary was there. I don't know about her. I don't know about Peter, how he reacted. But the general thought process of most of the people there, they were scared. How in the world did he just drop in? And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. We still are troubled today. All of us have troubles. We're still troubled about what, what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen this afternoon? I wonder if it crosses somebody's mind, how is it going to be when we get together with the family? Are we going to get along today or is there going to be a fight? We struggle with it all the time. And Jesus wants to give you peace. And then you hear this, and you hear me up here, and you're saying, well, I hope this guy hurries up and gets done. I'm, I, want, I want to get home and eat. Because if you're rushing like that, it's because maybe you have doubts. Maybe you doubt what I'm saying to be true. Only you can make the decision for you. I can stand here and attest to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. I can say he's a risen Lord. I can say for a fact that he forgave me of all my sins. And I can say for a fact that when I leave this place, I have a better place ahead of me called heaven. I can say that because I know that because I read it and I believe it. But if you don't believe it, and you don't receive it, you can't have it. I'm challenging you today, each one of you. I'm going to give an opportunity in a few minutes. I'm going to have Scott come up and play. In fact, you can come up now if you want to. I, I, I know it's Easter Sunday and everybody's got something to do, but there's nothing more important than your spirit, your life today, because you don't know if you've got tomorrow to deal with. You have no idea what's going to happen this afternoon. But I want you to look into your spirit. I want you to look into your very soul. And I want you to understand and recognize, have I got doubts? Do I know what my life has before me? Do I have a relationship with the living God? Or am I just going to fumble around and stumble around in life until the day comes that I die? And because I never had a relationship with the only one that could bring me to heaven, that I'm signing my, my, my certificate to go to hell. Total separation from God for the rest of your life. An absence of peace for the rest of your life. In fact, so far, we actually have some peace in this world, which is why we can feel a little bit of that now. But what hell offers to us is absence of all peace. Absence of all love. Absence of all joy. But only you can make that decision. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And let me tell you something. What I'm telling you when I say these things, it's based on a faith. Faith is something that you believe in that you can't see, but you know is true. 
I cannot, for the life of me, put a picture in my mind of the love that I have for my wife. But you can never convince me that I do not love her. We cannot put a picture on what the faith is, what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. But I know this, that if you exercise that little seed of faith that God gave each one of us and reach out and accept him and receive him, your life will be changed forever. So it says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Did you catch that? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, believe that God, that Jesus is Lord. Accept that. That means you have to give up your lordship. You have to get off your throne and let him sit down and he'll take care of you. Which he'll do a better job than you're doing anyway, I guarantee that, because he's the creator. We are the creation. He knows exactly what you need. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and then you've got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You can be like many of these people at the graveyard that didn't understand, even though they could not find Jesus anymore in the tomb, there's no way that he could have been raised from the dead. Even though he showed himself to over 500 people in the 40 days he stayed on earth, 500 people attest to the fact they saw Jesus. But there's so many that say, I can't believe it. Well, it's not that you can't, it's that you won't. Well, Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for being with us today. I thank you, Lord God, for sending your son. What a perfect plan. Beyond our comprehension, but what a perfect plan. And it's all because you love each and every one of us. And you desire a relationship with each and every one of us. And you're not a distant deity that we can never come to, but Lord God, because of what Jesus went through, though, when, he, when, he, when he died on the cross and he said, it is finished, the earth shook. And the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Symbolizing that now there is nothing that stops us from going right to the Father. Sin no longer has control over us when we depend on you, Lord Jesus. But we can go to the Father, we can have a relationship with him any moment of any day. And we give you glory and honor for that, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I pray that each person that's in this place, Lord God, would just go out, enjoy this day. I pray, Lord, that your presence would be with them and that they would be mindful of the things that they've heard today from your heart. And I pray, God, that people in this place would know peace beyond what they've ever had before. Let them walk in it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.